the second is uh, two, two things. One is we are members of the Hyperledger Foundation, or I don't know what they call themselves today. Uh, maybe Dan knows better, but uh, we are bound by anti antitrust rules wherever we are. The other um, takeaway is that we are meant to be kind to each other. That means even if we disagree with someone, you don't have to be disagreeable. That is the main, um, the second takeaway. And without waiting in much longer. I think uh, we should start the presentation and uh, hopefully, I, I mean, what is your preference, Robert? Uh, do you want people to ask you questions uh, in the chat, people to um, wait till the end, whatever is appropriate? Um, I'm yeah, I'm fine with interrupting the presentation because that's the easiest way sometimes to address the question. Uh, uh, right away, I can say, I think everyone is aware of that when you're presenting, it's really hard to follow the chat. So if there is any question on the chat, they can feel free to interrupt uh, me and just read out this question and we can address it right away. And then obviously afterwards, we'll have a time for discussion with anyway. So I will try to, uh, to leave some yes. time at the end. Yes. Um, and I'm uh, I'm happy that you're here. We have had uh, you guys present earlier, maybe a year or two ago, on the uh, decentralized semantics. But it's all about taking control of your own destiny, in a way. Um, Indeed. Uh, up, up to the extent uh, it's possible. Um, and pushing that boundary further and further, that is the key, uh, key to this topic, I think. Uh, and let's uh, start with uh, the presentation. Okay, perfect. So let me share the, the slides. Uh, let me know if everything looks okay. Looks good. Perfect. So um, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for having, having me today. Um, today I would like to introduce uh, to some of you which didn't heard of uh, yet or those who actually heard of about this concept some time ago, a, a, an update and the introduction to, to what is going on in that space. Um, uh, the overall topic of today uh, presentation is the micro ledger, and I will explain why and exactly we call it that way and what it means, and what are the consequences of this authentic data component which we are using heavily in the dynamic data economy. So my name is Robert Mitvitsky. I'm uh, I'm a founder, co-founder of the Human Colossus Foundation. I'm a technical technical uh, head of the Technology Council at Human Colossus Foundation. Um, my background is in the software engineering. I'm involved in the decentralized technologies uh, for some time already. Uh, I had a chance to, uh, to take a part in the different activities around the standardization and uh, development of the decentralized components. Um, I was one of the contributors to the uh, Fair Data Economy uh, guidebook, uh, which ended up as a working group at the uh, uh, European Standardization Committee. Uh, I'm, um, uh, I'm representing um, a Swiss standardization association within the discussions on the digital identity in the European standardization committee, JTC 19. Um, I'm as well a contributor to the Hyperledger ecosystem, as you may know me from, from uh, semantic and the input working group, as well the ACDC authentic chain data containers uh, task force and some other places uh, uh, in the different communities like Decentralized Identity Foundation, where we are strongly working on the, on the components of the key event receipt infrastructure. Uh, so um, 
Today we would like to introduce you the the, the, the findings which we uh, which we um, uh, faced over the course of the last couple of uh, months, uh, where where we developed those uh, components, and uh, we try to encapsulate this know-how in a in a decent way to explain to everyone why this approach is better than anything else which we saw so far, and we'll see how that how that um, uh, reveals. So on the high level, microletter is an event transaction lock. So what it means is that basically you have a cryptographically bind, bound self-certifying identifiers enabling um, um, uh, the possibility to and verify this data structure no matter where it is, right? You can verify the origin, the changes, and the way how actually it evolves over the <coughs> course of the time. And obviously it provides you the details supporting this confidence uh, or validity of the data. So what that exactly means, uh, we'll, we'll need to explain based on, uh, on the where, where, where we started with it. So in the Human Colossus Foundation, we are working on something which we call dynamic data economy. And long story short, this is a set of the components which enables us to create a truly decentralized ecosystem where the data can flow, where the data can be easily shared and the user uh, or the subject is able to control the data, not only from the perspective of the ownership, but as well trans, trans, um, traceability and trans, transparency within the whole ecosystems, how the data are consumed and by whom. And to achieve those goals, uh, we came up with this uh, model, which uh, allows us to boil it down to uh, the specific characteristics of the data. So we are starting with the pure data at the level of the integrity, where we in the semantic domain, we're defining the meaning of the data and integrity of the data means that you uh, basically addressing um, um, the problem of uh, knowing what it is, not where it is, not who created it, but what it is. And only that gives us a, a very powerful mechanism to be able to already start up operating on the data and creating a different types of the data pipelines. But obviously, obviously integrity is not the only characteristics which we are interested in. Another uh, which follows that uh, is the authenticity. There's something which we call factual authenticity of the data, where uh, we want to know who created it. What was the origin uh, of that information uh, when it was created? And this is exactly the, the topics which the input domain address uh, with the information of the, of the whole infrastructure of the decentralized key management, identifiers, and all the aspects of who created the data and when. But obviously that's not enough because when you look on the data, only knowing what it is and who created it doesn't mean or doesn't gives you any clue about the veracity of the information. So this is where the governance layer on top of that comes into the game, which uh, gives you the answers uh, and provides you this consensual veracity, which means that maybe based on the reputation of the person who created that, maybe uh, based on the rules or uh, a different ethical aspects of the, of the data exchange within that jurisdiction, you'll be able to reason about the veracity of that information. So this pyramid, we call it accurate data pyramid. And uh, the reason why it is pyramid because none of the above component can exist without the underlying component. So you can't talk about authentic data if you do not have objectual integrity. But that means that if you sign any arbitrary data or maybe a location where the data are with the possibility that the data can be changed and you will not be able to detect that, then obviously you can't reason about the authenticity of that information because if the data can change, so what that you sign something which could change, right? It doesn't make any sense. And, and this is very important to understand that those two layers um, providing um, a technical or machine um, um, uh, security, in a sense, there is no trust involved in those two layers, it means there is no governance around that, there is no rules around that, it's just purely about the cryptographical assurance of the object and who created it or who signed it, right? All the trust comes from this layer from the governance above. So you, based on those rules and the, and the information which you're collecting overall, you can 
figure it out if this information which you have, what is the veracity of that information? Is that really true? Is that, you know, it could be subjective true, uh, <laughs> but but based on the rules and the understanding of that, you can you can reason on that. So that's where we started. And, and we realized that to actually achieve that, we need to start thinking slightly differently. And one of the reasons is uh, that those two technical layers, they cannot be dependent on any governance layer. What that means is that you can't operate on the network like a blockchain or anything like that, where the given governance actually can control the data. No one except the one who actually creates it controls the data here. There is no way that someone will be able to, uh, to impact that. Only as soon as the data will start flow and uh, the governance rules will apply, there is a governance around the data flow, not the data itself. So. Uh, that lead us to the working uh, task force uh, in ACDC, Authentic Chain Data Containers. So for those who don't know what it is, is the, um, the attempt to solve the problem of authenticity of the information or uh, find, to find, find a general model for something which a lot of people call verifiable credentials. So how you pack authentic data in a way that it can uh, serve as uh, attestation, as a verifiable credential, as uh, authorization mechanism, authentication me mechanism, and so on. Because there was a lot of different standards and a lot of different attempts addressing pretty much the same thing, but everyone did that in a, his own way, because I'm interested only about authorization. So they skip all the, um, all the aspects of verifiable credential, for example, right? And, um, and the initiative which was started by Sam Smith with the ACDC give this way of thinking about that we can create a data container which can be end verifiable and it doesn't rely on any underlying infrastructure and it can be portable. And this is very important. We'll see the use cases around that. Can I? So we up? took that. Yeah, please. Um, before we go further, just to go back a couple of slides, uh, there is a uh, something which says self-certified, right? Um, which obviously mean the person who, or the authenticity is a self-certifying identifier. Uh, yep. So the semantics uh, to the, you know, when you have this layered approach, you have a building of uh, capability, I suppose. And on the other hand, there is the arrow coming down from the top, which you are saying is a problem in certain circumstances, especially if it interferes with the free flow of data. Uh, so in the absence of a transport layer of some sort, um, how, you know, how can you make that claim? Because in the end, you have to transport it somehow, uh, whether it is uh, through the internet, through, uh, you know, through a, through a message, through email, through whatever mechanism we have. So all of them have governance that can actually stop the flow of that data. Sure. So and and you... actually, yeah. And so to answer that question, the reason why it's done that way is that you can realize that as soon as you do not have a dependency on the governance in those layers, anytime on top of that, you can add this governance by, for example, how, how the transportation will happen. It really depends on the use case, right? You could say that, okay, we are transporting data over a simple HTTP because we have a servers and, you know, uh, uh, server client architecture and we're exchanging information that way. But you could think of the use case where you have the two mobile devices communicating over Bluetooth, right? And then because they are not dependent on the transportation layer and the governance, you are able to do so because because if you start with the limitation of the uh, of the governance on those two layers, then you're obviously limiting the use cases, and you kind of came up with the general concept of how actually you can compose that. So everything related with the transportation and how the rules applying to the flow of the information is starting on the above layers, which allows us to be very flexible in the context of what type of the infrastructure or the use cases we can uh, we can apply. So there are two two other things with that. One is, 
that there is a discoverability of the semantics which is usually through registries or some common place, common uh, location, unless you transport the metadata along with the uh, data saying, this is what I'm sending you and this is what it looks like. And then uh, you will say, depending on a minimum a set of acceptable characteristics, whether you're signing it properly, can I discover who's signing by looking somewhere else? You know, so there's always, um, even if uh, the data is completely portable, there's always uh, mechanisms by which you'll have to look outside that packet, the lowest layer, right. even if it's coming to you. Uh, so, there, you know, that is uh, taken as a given, I suppose, in this context. And uh, just shortly, I will comment that, and if, if it's okay for you, I will address that later on on the yeah, yeah, example sure. of that. I don't want to stop this. Uh, uh, yeah. Well. Because actually, I will mention about exactly that one, how this works, because it's just about purely assumption of the security uh, of those specific layers. But then the security allows you to have much more flexibility on the on the level of the discoverability because of the thing how you're addressing it in the context of you care what it is, not where it is. Then it allows you to have a different types of the infrastructure for the resolution mechanism. I will address that at the later uh, later slides. I will show the examples. So um, yeah, so. What exactly this pyramid is trying to address is uh, 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 change the way how we think about the data, that we're securing the data, not the location. So we know always what it is. Then we are attaching authenticity to it. So we know who say so and who say, uh, and this who is very tricky because who it could mean that is just identifier and we have no idea about identity of that person because this another part of the who comes from the governance. Like for example, is that identifier a really a doctor? Is that identifier a really part of our supply chain, right? So that's that's a split here, which you need to be careful when actually you're thinking about that. But what we mean here is that who from the perspective of uniqueness of that identifier within the ecosystem, which the signature, <coughs> sorry, signatures represents. So, uh, having said that, um, <coughs> we started thinking about the mechanism which actually we started developing in the ACDC, Authentic Chain Data Containers. And we started realizing that actually a lot of people uh, uh, tried to build a similar solution like ACDC. And for whatever reasons, they didn't want it to go for ACDC per se. And um, uh, there was a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one of them was um, a very strict way how the ACDC encouraged to build those data structures and do not, um, um, let's say, um, there was no room for uh, doing the mistakes. And the ACDC is designed that specifically that way just to assure about the security of those objects. All the objects needs to be immutable. All, all the objects are uh, linked to the cryptographical hashes. Uh, there is a set of the different properties within the ACDC as a base where you have uh, identifier of the person or entity who creates that. You have the information about the data itself. You have the information about the semantic and you have the information about the rules which <coughs> could be applied, <coughs> sorry, could be applied uh, to the specific data which you have here. For example, uh, consent or purpose of the usage of the data, data agreement, or maybe other rules which can be applied or eventually cryptographically enforced during the process of processing those information. So we try to look on that from the perspective of a little bit more generic um, um, aspects. And we came up with this um, a concept of the microledger because it was easier to explain to people what exactly ACDC is. Because Technological speaking, microledger is ACDC. If you if you dive to the details, and I will show you exactly how that how that uh, uh, rolls out. Um, the reason why we pick the microledger as a name is always a reference towards this: what people are talking about the blockchain. That you have this magical blockchain which ensures you about the uh, uh, verifiability or or in, uh, immutability of the content. Right? Microledger is exactly that thing. It's a blockchain, but it's a one-node blockchain. You just basically have this list of cryptographical data linked together. 
So the microledger characteristics, as you see on the slide, there is a, a bunch of them, but here is the most important one. Um, starting with the n verifiability. So this is what uh, everyone is <clears throat> so interested in the blockchain because it gives you exactly that pro the properties. What it means is it, it's, uh, it's a very simple concept, which is uh, pretty old, um, but it's very powerful that you have uh, a blocks which are chained cryptographically. Each block is linked with a previous one to his identifier. And this way, you can, uh, you can create a, a, a data structure, which you can verify from the perspective of the, um, of the chaining mechanism. So you have this digital fingerprint, uh, which represents the whole block, right? Whatever is inside this digital fingerprint is basically one way function over that block. So it's tied to the content itself. So it means that if you're pointing to it, you know that you're pointing to exactly that content, whatever is inside, right? And if the content will change, the digital fingerprint will not work, right? So it will be different. Just one bit, one bit off, and you know that this is not the block which you are looking for, right? So that's a very simple concept, but it gives you this, um, this mechanism of uh, linking the data together. Not only that, whatever you put inside the block, right? We always putting that in the form of the seal. What is seal? Seal is basically um, a one-way function over the data which you want to, want to anchor on the block. And here, uh, and the reason for that is actually there is a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, the size of the seal is pretty much predictable, means that you can grow this block, uh, this microledger <coughs> to, 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 uh, to uh, a lot of blocks without impacting the performance of verifiability of those, of those blocks. <coughs> You could anchor, for example, a terabytes of the medical data in there without impacting the performance of verifying of, of the blocks altogether, right? Uh, another reason is the privacy, because you don't know how this microledger will be used and where it will be transported. In many cases, if you are dealing with a sensitive information, you don't want to put them in a visible and easy accessible way. Uh, so in many cases, you will seal something which could be even encrypted in addition. Right, and then you'll need to have additional mechanisms for the resolution of that seal. Right, so how I will get the actual content within that block, and this is where this resolution and discoverability mechanism comes into play. And you have two options. One is you basically attach the seal uh, content uh, as an attachment to the block. So when you're transporting it uh, and and coding it for the purpose of sending it out, you're basically attaching. Uh, the information all together to the block. It could be a semantic, it could be a data, it could be one of another, or it could be everything all together, right? So everything is self-contained. You don't need to reach out to any other source for the information. But if you want to have an additional, for example, controlling mechanism in the context of who actually can access the information, right? You could, or you could apply a different cryptographical methods to actually uh, attach it to the seal attachment, means that it's encrypted and only people with a specific key can decrypt that, or you create a seals registry where actually you have a separate repository where people can reach to ask for the content related with that block. In many cases, uh, uh, especially that true for a, a lot of different transactions, is that the data which is inside here is not very interesting from the perspective of whoever receives that. And we'll see that on the supply chain example. But for the auditor or someone who actually will need to verify in case something bad goes wrong, he will need to reach to the seal registry, retrieve the content and verify that this is exactly the content which was part of that data exchange as, um, <coughs> as it happened, right? So this way you can split the verifiability of the data set from the data itself, because in many cases, you don't need to have them upfront. You could use the different methods of the zero knowledge proofs attached to the block and the data outside in case if it needed and so on. So there's a lot of uh, flexibility into that. So uh, following next one, composability. Um, so the, the reason of the, so the data structure is relatively simple and this gives us a powerful methods of creating any, I see the hands up. If, uh, but I don't yeah. see it. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Please. but I just wanted to ask. So the, the seals you're saying are, are hashes of 
of the data that you're sharing or uh, right okay so it, it, so uh, uh, yeah this is hyperledger um, uh, identity working group so if there's identity data personally identifiable information including potentially biometrics let's say yep. so you're saying this seal could be a hash of personally identifiable information that's stored on an immutable ledger. Exactly. Whatever, I mean, the, the, whatever you store it, it doesn't matter uh, because uh, that's that's the, basically a specific to the use case where you put it and what is reasonable in that specific use case. But it's exactly that thing. You have a, you run one way one way function for on the content which you want to attach it. If it's a self uh, sorry uh, sensitive information which you don't want to reveal, you just put a hash of that which then eventually can be used to prove that actually those sensitive information was part of this transaction without putting them in the first place. Um, it's like uh, a lot of people talking about this anchoring mechanism on the blockchain is basically the same idea. You're just putting a cryptographical uh, hash of that content or whatever data attributes we are talking about and anchoring that into the block. And another uh, point is that uh, this can be called a commitment, which uh, obviously the English word uh, says it all because you're saying I'm committed. I've committed this particular information to the uh, to the to a uh, global witness. And uh, once I've committed that, I have no way to go back and change my commitment because I exactly I hashed very it. good point. Yeah. And the reason for that is something which we'll see later on because it's all about accountability within that chain. So if you're using that within the supply chain, I will talk later a little bit, uh, you'll realize that this is exactly what, what the, the entities wants to, that in case if something bad happened, I can always get back and figure it out. Okay, what did you commit to? What was the transaction data which were uh, exchanged uh, during that time? Yeah, no, thanks for that. Uh, the main reason why I asked is, uh, is GDPR Article 29, uh, that uh, hashing is a form of pseudonymization, but not anonymization. So we have to be careful of what we're, what we're hashing and, and putting, um, especially on an immutable ledger where it cannot be deleted ever, right? Exactly. Why do they say that if it's a one-way function? Because it's still it, associated. It, sorry, I was jumping on that because it can still associate it with a person, uh, a real world person. And right. If you can, so if you hash Dan Bockenheimer one way hash, you, it's it's pseudonymized, but it's linkable basically. What you're saying is, if the data parts of the data are known, uh, but you know, I mean, if if somebody is hashing Dan Bockenheimer, yes, but if it's uh, lots of other information along with it, plus a salt or something that makes it uh, um, not back, you know, you cannot get back the data. Uh, it's a one-way function that essentially removes information, uh, quite a bit of information. Uh, so it depends, right? I mean, in the sense that, yeah, if it's just your name, yes, you can try everybody's name and see what the hash comes out to be, and if it matches, you know that it's the name Dan Backenheimer. Yeah, yeah. so bottom line is, yeah, it, 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 you're talking about a well-designed situation where you're aware of these vulnerabilities uh, and you're dealing with them. That's all I wanted to bring up is just to make sure that the meaning of a seal is a one-way hash of data. And, and now we've exposed some of the considerations as, as we just been talked about. So yeah, thanks for that, sorry. And plus, uh, he also mentioned that you, you could uh, actually encrypt the data, which is... Uh, exactly, and actually, depending on who you ask, some people will say actually that encrypted data and the hash of the encrypted data is still linkable because if you will have all the components, you can link it and figure it out that actually it was that, but uh, obviously, it's like kind of overkill to uh, because we already have all the information, right? What's the 
what's the value in 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 the linking mechanism between that if you already have it but anyway that's 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 something which i think it's very um i think on the political level it, it will be really hard to solve that problem because there is always a danger that it could be used in a in a wrong way but uh i think having encrypted data and attach the seal of the encrypted data in the block uh, let's say mitigates all most of the risks which could arise from that and obviously if you are super concerned about that you should never ever use your sensitive information in any ways that you will not be sure about so that's um, then you um robert well. excuse me <laughs> yeah robert, please. excuse me i've got a question uh, this is Roland for i i would want to know uh, if in your concept um is, is this the cryptographical hash of the seal that is the proof uh, that um, when you perform an audit, audit trail on the data, is it uh, really the, the hash that is uh, the clue? Exactly. That's something which can be used for the audits and prove that this is exactly, uh, as Vipin as mentioned, commitment what you did for that specific transaction. And then you can, uh, because in many cases, uh, auditors actually have access to more of the, more data than actually uh, those people who are actually performing transaction. Imagine a situation where you're exchanging a package from one provider to another. They don't need to know too much about that, except that they need to take this package from this guy and send it there, right? But if the audit uh, will came in, they could have access to information of the personal identity of the guy who actually did the transaction, and then additional information on the other side of the uh, specific person who actually received that package, right? And then everything that can be done through this kind of sealing mechanism where you can point it to the registry of the data where actually those information could be retrieved, you could split it, you could basically attach any data objects into there depending on the use cases. But that's the predominant use case of that, that you can achieve a high level of accountability uh, and the security um, from the perspective of the audit trial. So, so you confirm that the, that the hash is the clue? Yes. Thank you. OK. Um, I think we can move on. So the next characteristics is about uh, the possibility to compose those microledgers, right? So imagine that you have a one data structure and you want to build on top of it something which continues that information outside of the jurisdiction of whoever actually started it. And, uh, and a very good example is in the supply chain in the after sales market where you're buying something, you basically, uh, in most of the supply chains, that's the end of the chain, right? But actually if you buy a car and later on you sell it, right? Or any other goods, right? You could continue, <coughs> continue that and um, uh, collect additional information about the good which, are, uh, which you have. And, um, and that's true for any type of the data I imagine that you created a book which you're creating in the form of this kind of micro ledger, and then someone takes it and remix it in a sense that uh, derive a, a new version of that book or create a new story, a new chapter, the same of the remixing of the musics. There is a powerful mechanism where actually you can compose that. For those who are technical, who's work with the Docker containers, that's a very good analogy what the Docker is doing with the Docker files that you can actually build uh, a new extensions to the underlying layers of the data structure, which is in that case, Docker container, you're just adding a new staff to it and you have a cryptographical link between them. So you can verify this is exactly the layer which you're referring to. And here is the truth for uh, that, that. That's true for the micro ledger that you can anchor a previous another micro ledger and connect them with the one which you created, right? Um, and this gives you a possibility not only to have a linear uh, uh, chain, but you could have a DAC, you could have a, a tree structure, you could have a, any type of the data structure, which, uh, <laughs> which is valid for your use case. Um, so the next one, uh, which is pretty cool and um, maybe not very much um, intuitive, um, the ownership, because um, by definition of the ownership, the microledger doesn't have the owner per se, and not in the context of the, uh, as you could think of, it's much more uh, as a custodian uh, of, uh, of that specific block. So uh, the reason why so is that because we wanted to have a data structure which is portable, 
right? So obviously, if you think about verifiable credential, that's not very useful because, I mean, given verifiable data structure to a person, we don't want to let him transfer that to someone else. There's not many, maybe, I, actually, there is a bunch of use cases, actually, which could leverage that. But if you think about any arbitrary data, like a package which is traveling through the whole world, right? You want to make sure that the information will be consistent and verifiable, but each time when you're passing to another person, you kind of giving away the control to that person so he can take care of the continuation of that blog. So no one needs to go back to you to ask you for a permission to add something to it, right? So you could imagine that uh, you have, uh, you're starting a micro ledger with Alice and Bob, and they, those two entities through the multisig uh, controlling uh, um, the mechanism of, um, of those blocks. Not only to the multi six, you could have a threshold uh, signature, uh, different types of the techniques where you could actually say that two out of five keys needs to sign the block to be valid. There is a flexibility into that. And they continue extending the blocks. And then in a point of time, they saying that, okay, we're passing that to Charles. And now only Charles is allowed to uh, uh, control that uh, uh, microledger, controlling that data structure, right? You could imagine that as a form of having a book which, uh, or any digital content, which you're passing IP rights to another person to continue to work, right? And actually there is interesting use case, which we are working on leveraging the microledger to combine it together with the Git repository where each commit which you are doing will include um, all the uh, information about the IP rights, about the uh, patents, about all the necessary information which allows you to truly give it away um, uh, to, uh, to uh, let's say open source ecosystem. So you will not need to have a governance around the code uh, to trace each individual developer to actually figure it out if they didn't claim something later on or if they didn't uh, you know, change their minds and stuff like that, right? So there is a, a cool stuff around that, uh, which, uh, which we could discuss later on. Um, so, and the, la the, the, the last one is the um, kind of uh, flexibility of that construct. And this is why this was one of the reasons why actually we started uh, creating something outside of ACDC and create this generic concept of the micro ledger because we realized that a lot of people uh, claim that they will not like to use ACDC because it's used Caesar at encoding instead of something else. It uses a controlling identifier. Uh, which uh, we don't like, or we would like to use another one, or it uses specific types of the signatures or digital fingerprints and things like that, right? So each of the components within the micro ledger is, um, it can be swapped and can be changed depending on the case which you have, right? So the encoding interface, so how you encode the blocks and how you transport them, it could use a different techniques. You could use uh, uh, um, um, Caesar as it, as it is using them. In the carry ecosystem, you could use a multi codex, you could use uh, some existing stuff, uh, you could use uh, um, um, <laughs> something which doesn't exist yet. And later on, you basically apply it here as a module, and then uh, you use that specific um, um, uh, technique for, uh, for that specific module. And each of the mechanisms like seals, uh, digital fingerprints, there's a bunch of techniques right now available on the market which could be used for that uh, to uh, implement uh, or to provide implementation of the specific component. But the micro ledger as a, as a concept doesn't, uh, doesn't assume that there is a specific techniques use because in many cases, for example, a lot of people would like to use a PKI uh, a centralized PKI uh, solution for managing identities of those who are actually uh, controlling those, uh, uh, those pieces of the information. And that's fine. I mean, it won't be very portable, but maybe for that specific use case, it will do the job, right? Obviously, from our perspective, from the truly decentralized ecosystems, currently we implemented the micro ledger based on the Caesar, based on the um, uh, carry as a controlling identifier, the skits as a signature interface, so the self-certifying identifiers, which comes from Kerry, self-addressing identifiers for the digital uh, fingerprint, and timestamping authority as a mechanism to actually anchor a time when this information was created. And obviously, you could use a different mechanism, like a blockchain and you know things like that, 
And uh, currently we have implementation of the block attachments, but as well like external repository, which is uh, a custom custom customized uh, repository similar to the repository which we're using for overlays capture architecture. And, and taking that into consideration, you, you, you see immediately that decoupling it from any specific vendor or any blockchain, any, any network, it gives you the possibility to move around those blocks across the different networks, right? And uh, allows you to have this truly decentralized and portable, decentralized in quotes, in a sense, depending on which components you will use, but you can really achieve a truly decentralized portable data structure, which can serve a different purposes. So this is pretty much how, uh, how we started uh, kind of reasoning about that, where we said that, okay, um, we started with this micro ledger and then we realized it's okay, but the micro ledger is not necessary for a lot of use cases. The, the thing which actually is pretty much enough is, uh, is something which we call nano ledger right now, which is basically a cryptographical link of the data. And you can see that in the networks like BitTorrent, uh, a different data exchange, OCA repositories heavily use that concept where you don't care who controls that or who created it. You care what it is because of the use case doesn't require to know who actually controlling that or who owns it or uh, who, uh, who issue that, right? But uh, definitely the most interesting one is the mechanism where you have actually controlling identifiers, the kind of state logic and the signatures around that because then you can encapsulate a lot of different interesting use cases uh, around that concept. And uh, saying that obviously the micro ledger itself can be used uh, without any layer of the governance, but as, um, as there was questioned before, in many cases, actually the governance is necessary. How you, uh, for example, uh, reason about the time when it was created, right? So you need to have this authentic timestamp which means that there is authority, which everyone trusts within the given jurisdiction, that this indeed is a verifiable timestamp issued by this uh, entity. So this is where the governance comes in and you have this timestamping authority. You could use a blockchain as a global kind of timestamping mechanism for that uh, specific uh, blocks or any other sorts of the timestamping authority, which, uh, which people trust. It really depends on the use case. But then you have a different mechanism of the duplicity detection. And this is the topics of the NFTs, like non-fungible tokens that people are claiming that I bought this for a million dollars, uh, this picture belongs to me, is that, okay, who say so? I can copy it and say it's mine, right? So it really depends on the governance around that and how you actually enforce this duplicity detection uh, <laughs> and make sure that actually people obey the rules in a given jurisdiction, right? Um, there is a bunch of stuff related with uh, uh, semantic of the data that you could have a uh, rule saying that if you're, for example, anchoring the data, medical data, they need to follow a specific semantic, um, you know, including uh, sensitive information or stripping out sensitive information and things like that. A glossary, for example, what what is named how and what is the definition of this, what is inside, how we understand the definition of that of that information. The trust registry, which obviously allows you to identify who is actually control, controlling identifier. And here example is like, if you have a car and you're servicing that car, right? You want to make sure that the service was done by authorized um, uh, dealer, right? So you can verify in the trust registry that this controlling identifier belongs actually to that uh, car dealer, uh, which is, um, uh, which, uh, which then, brings the value of the data itself and not that you have any kind of car dealer which actually fixed the car. Uh, maybe it could be a fake one or maybe someone who are actually not following the, the quality standards as you're expecting, right? Um, and there is additional this data sharing engine. I will not talk much about that. <clears throat> Just mention about this. As soon as you have those micro ledgers, you can pack them in the something which we call data sharing engine, which allows you to create a, a kind of a data pool of uh, like a place where actually you can query this kind of data uh, data pools in a, pri a privacy preserved ways and exchange those information in the in the global uh, or local or global scale doesn't matter but you have an interface is how you like a repositories for those micro ledgers if you if you uh, 
if you think that way. So here is uh, what uh, just an example of what actually can go into the seal. And this is this comes directly from the ACDC uh, example that the seal uh, can include the semantic of the data, the rules for the data, like data agreement, the uh, terms and conditions, the purpose where the data can be used. So you can actually have something which will be meaningful for the auditor in case in your company, let's say you're buying a data set of the users for your campaign and you can show to the auditor that actually you collected those information according to all the rules, according to the GDPR, according to the, all the uh, uh, legal framework, which you're operating in that you have a concept of each individual user allowing you to use the data for that specific purpose, right? And obviously the data itself. Um, yeah, so that's just a uh, repetition of that. There's a bunch of the references here. Um, if you like, I can share that, those slides uh, for those who wants to, you know, uh, have it, um, it's not a problem. But now uh, what I wanted to uh, give you is that like, okay, nice concept, sounds cool, but what we can do with it, right? So one of the uh, kind of motto which we have uh, is this phrase which you see on the screen is data is like electricity. It has value when it flows, right? And this is exactly what we are trying to achieve, to have a portable data structure, which allows us to send the data whatever we need or whatever we want to, right? Not as a part of the network, not as a part of a specific ecosystem, but whatever I want to, I want to parse the data. To give an example, uh, let's say I'm based in Austria, I go to a doctor, I retrieve my medical records from my doctor. Now, I would like to share those medical da data with a doctor in Germany, because I have a friend of mine who is a, a, a specialist in, uh, in that space, and he could advise me and provide me a, a medical advice, and that's what I did. So I would like to send my medical data in a secure and uh, authentic way to him, and obviously, he's not part of the Austrian ecosystem and the and the, um, uh, infrastructure for the medical uh, doctor. So he will not be able to get that information uh, through the official channel. So I will I will be able to take it, package it, ship to him, and then uh, he will be able to be sure that the data were not tampered. That he can really work on the data from the perspective of the medical aspects. Um, so one of the predominant use cases where actually we are using Microledger, trying to apply that, is in the supply chain. And briefly, I, I'm pretty sure that most of you know what is supply chain and how it works, uh, depending on the scenario and the use case, you always kind of have this a chain of the uh, entities and the actions which are necessary to, to reach the goal. And normally, you're starting with the raw materials providing to the uh, uh, by suppliers to the manufacturing, where the, uh, they producing a product, then there is a distribution chain, then you have a retail locations where this uh, goods are distributed, and finally, the customer purchase those information. And as you know, the economy is very complex. It could happen that you have a product, raw materials coming from China, going to India. India, uh, as a manufacturing provider, building the products through the distribution chain, they are distributing it to the Middle East. Then the Middle East uh, distributes further on to Europe, and they end up in the store in Berlin, and then the customer comes and buy it, right? Getting all of those guys on one platform, impossible, right? And why we actually want to address those problems. So there is a bunch of benefits which are coming directly from the supply chain ecosystem, uh, where you have you want to manage the demand. So you want to know how, when, and you know properly balance the uh, the the necessary materials, how many of them, or how much you need. To, for the production, what is the demand of the market and stuff like that. You need to, to have a data for that. Uh, carry uh, the right amount of the inventory. So uh, again, the same pretty much in, uh, information necessary to understand how much you need to pre be prepared. Uh, dealing with the distributions, disruption, sorry. Uh, so in case if something happened, you need to be react fast and reaction depends on the uh, authentic information and proper information in the chain. So 
Um, keeping the cost to the minimum um, uh, uh, meets the customer demands in the most effective way possible. And something which is not possible currently, a feedback loop on every step of the chain. And I will show you in a moment how that works. So a lot of people say that, okay, blockchain came, we solve all those problems. A lot of companies try that, they fail. And it's really a huge companies which did a project with blockchains which failed in supply chain. Because they thought, okay, we need a blockchain because we need to have a time stamping. We need to have a tracking, automating transactions, smart contracts, what's not. Everything needs to be solid and, and works reliable. Then they would like they would like to minimize the involvement of the intermediaries, right? Such as bankers, insurance brokers, because of the smart contracts and the smartness of the blockchain, right? Um, set up the wide range of the self-execution -exec contracts allows you to automate that process, right? So make it way efficient and way faster. You don't need to rely on the papers and you know passing stuff and things like that. Um, the quality uh, and the proof of the quality and proof of the provenance, the payments, performance, all that stuff could minimize <clears throat> counterfeiting and the fraud within the whole chain, right? And obviously, they had a, a promise to make it easier, faster, and cheaper because of the technology, right? But it didn't work. And uh, why it didn't work? Why you don't want to use the blockchain uh, for the supply chain? One of the predominant problem is that lack of interoperability. And the interoperability I mean is that I start in one ledger and move to another ledger. If you don't have that one, you need to onboard everyone to one ledger. If you're onboarding everyone to one ledger, then you have a problem with the governance framework. Who decides who can join, right? A lot of organizations are afraid of that, that there is just one entity or even a consortium deciding who can join that specific supply chain, right? And it could be used against some political regimes or, uh, uh, or other way around. It's basically hard to convince everyone that this will work, right? Not mentioning about the scaling and the privacy issues related with the blockchain. Uh, it was mentioned before that uh, you no know, privacy preserving mechanism is not a domain of the blockchain because as soon as you put something there, it's immutable. You can't remove it. You can't hide it. It's available to everyone who have access to the blockchain, right? So the microledger come really handy. And we realized that actually we can design a system where we can leverage carry as a decentralized key management infrastructure to actually create identities for all of those guys who are actually participating in the network, package it into micro ledger data containers and pass it as soon as the goods are moving around, right? So we have a bunch of the containers identified by decentralized uh, ident identifier. And by the way, when I'm saying decentralized identifier in that context, it's not what you think. And I'm sorry for that, but I couldn't find a better word for that. Uh, decentralized identifier is not the one which is following the DID core spec. It's something which we um, uh, try to, um, uh, so this is what the carry introduced is that this is a decentralized identifier without the namespace. You have just a prefix as it's called, it's a hash and it doesn't rely on any method or any network or any namespace uh, it's not it's not needed for that and and this way you achieving the, the the true portability of those objects so here is an example of the uh, vaccines the produ production of the raw materials suppliers manufacturers you have the uh, uh, here is a cal key event log uh, for uh, from the perspective of this micro ledger structure so it's a uh, uh, events chained together or the piece of the information chained together about the specific product, how it was produced, by whom, when, uh, and, and so on. And this information is floating through the whole system back to the uh, customer and uh, distribution centers and um, actually, oops, sorry for that. There you go. Um, where, uh, where you can get to the cu uh, customer. And what I wanted to show here on this, another example, this is about the car. The flow is pretty much the same. The principles are the same. It's just I wanted to show this um, or highlight this after sales mechanism where you have a customer who actually normally the supply chain ends here. 
where in that case, because of the portable uh, data structure, you can pass that information to the customer B and so on without need to actually be onboarded to any system, without being onboarded to any uh, vendor or whoever is behind that is uh, is truly decentralized approach for the secure data transfer in the in the very vast ecosystem. So um, a kind of summary of that, what we are able to do with the microledger is not only to solve the problems of the uh, of the supply chain uh, in a generic way or the data flows in a generic way, but what what we are able to enable is that you can have a feedback loop from any part of the chain back to any jurisdiction entity, whoever is interested in that. So for example, from the perspective of the vaccination, you actually can have a privacy preserved flow about who at the end got the vaccine. So you can actually leverage that for the counterfeiting programs or to understand uh, how your product is distributed or to establish a relationship with your customer uh, <clears throat> without need to onboard him to any specific uh, platform. Like let's say you're always buying Audi, you are a loyal customer. So next time when you buy Audi, you just get a discount or you get treated uh, way better because you can prove that you did that, even though that you bought that car uh, from the uh, second hand, or maybe you are third or fourth uh, um, owner of that car, right? So there is a lot of interesting aspects which uh, enables this feedback loop on every step of the chain. So, um, just briefly, before we'll go to the questions, I just wanted to mention about what we are doing with that and how actually we are proceeding for those who will be interested in that matter. Within the Human Colossus Foundation, we have something which is called Supply Chain Harmonization Program. This is a place where we created a natural ground for the entities who actually are interested in solving the problems in the supply chain in a truly decentralized way. And uh, we're working heavily on those technologies and providing our POCs and the expertise in, in the field of those technologies, helping those who are actually building a business cases on top of that, that they don't need to think about how to create own blockchain or how to solve all those problems. So if you are an entity which, will, which is interested in participating or contributing as an expert in that ecosystem, then obviously let us know and we are happy to uh, to get you uh, uh, join the program. Yeah, there's the structure of how the program is uh, structurized. Um, I will just leave that slide uh, so you can look it up uh, later on. And then how the how that works from the perspective of the financing and the, the, the uh, organizational point of view is that you can think of it like a foundation within the foundation. So the Human Colossus Foundation is a nonprofit foundation based in Switzerland, in Geneva, which is a solid ground for decentralized uh, components and building um, technologies around that um, uh, topic. And we are providing uh, programs for organizations who are interested to apply a decentralized technologies into specific application. And the supply chain is one of the one of those programs where we have. Um, uh, a separate wealth and asset management uh, and the steering committee uh, composed of the um, uh, of the organization who are willing to join and so we we're trying to build it in a way that uh, that uh, uh, that will truly solve the problems of uh, of those organizations in a truly decentralized way so that's it. Uh, I think I don't know what is time, but uh, if you have any questions, comments, or or feedback, happy happy to hear. Yeah, we can um, probably extend it. Uh, I don't think there are any uh, people uh, who who are using this Zoom link right away, but you know maybe five minutes or so. There were a couple of questions about uh, how is it different from rollups? How is it different from um, you know, those kind of off chains, side chains, those, that's the question that came up from Sandy. Thanks, Weapon. Yeah. So if you could please touch on that, that'd be, uh, that'd be good. So I see, I, I think you mentioned here, like one place, uh, that, uh, this is like, like we don't want to use supply, uh, blockchains in the supply chain industry because of the, the reasons you mentioned, uh, I, I understand your points over there. I'm trying to understand like, is like two questions here and we can go back and uh, on other details too. 
how is this going to be different uh, than side chains, for example? Like, I mean, if this is just a container where you can uh, have uh, basically pseudonymized data, not truly anonymized, then how is it exactly different than that? And uh, also, uh, I think you also mentioned that you can probably use this also for transfer ownership. I think that I found pretty uh, interesting thing. Like, so, so for instance, if you, uh, I'm, I'm going to bring an example here from the gaming side, like say you have an asset, you create an NFT, you create a micro ledger out of that. And uh, now I think the example you were taking for Docker was pretty apt that you can have a Docker template. So similarly, you can have an asset template, but now you want to apply a different layer on top of that. So how does that really work in this context? Like you can basically take it, but then who's really doing the consensus of that? Right. So, um, um, okay, so one by one. I mean, first of all, regarding the question about the side chain, actually the question should be, what's the difference between, between the blockchain and the side chain? Because that's the important to understand. Because the thing is that depending how you structureize the side chain and how you're anchoring it and where and who actually controls that side chain, gives you basically to the same position as having a blockchain, right? There's not much difference in that uh, in that respect. So the difference between the side chain and the micro ledger is that you don't rely on a specific network. You don't have to rely on any specific place where this information is put. You can basically imagine that right now having a side chain, you're basically cutting off whatever the uh, whatever is related with that specific information which you put there or you anchor it and you move it to another chain right or another place or a centralized system or whatever right so it's really it's really about this kind of um 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 way of thinking about the data as a not the location where it is or even anchoring it and stuff like that but the data as a whole thing as a self-containing information which can be packed and, and sent somewhere else and you don't care if there is a if it was starting on the side chain or the blockchain or centralized system or whatever you can have the whole thing all together with you so that's the um i hope that explains the difference in the way of thinking about that um the second thing about you ask about this concept of the nfts and the assets and things like that uh this is a, a kind of a tricky let me get back to the uh, where we have it. Oops. Yeah, let's let's stick with this one. Actually, this one is better. So um, when you have the chaining mechanism, right? So let's say you're starting with the item in the game and uh, then it's owned by Alice and then you eventually be selling it on eBay to someone else and someone else actually passing it to someone else and so on. So without having a proper governance around that it won't work because then you're relying on the assumption that whoever will look on that data set that they will be able to verify it up to the governance and in that case it will be the game itself right because you want to know that this item was truly generated in the game and if me as a Charles buying that item outside of the game will get back to the game and I will be able to use that item then it's good for me Right, So it really depends how you create the governance around the way how the data will be interpreted. Because this is what I mentioned about the NFTs is that you have the NFT, let's say uh, a Rembrandt, right? You bought it, it's yours, right? Who say so, right? I can make a copy of that and say, I bought it as well, right? And now someone needs to decide where is the origin or what is the root of that information that someone actually purchased it, right? So if you do not have this trust uh, anchor at the beginning somewhere, this governance who says that this is the information which are distributed, then you know none of the chaining mechanism will help. You could say that, yeah, uh, you can, the same problem is on the blockchains. So you're saying that, yeah, it's on blockchain, I was first, right? Doesn't mean anything until the whole ecosystem will agree that yes, we'll, we'll take that into consideration and we'll respect the rules. That as soon as something is on that blockchain, will take it as a, as, as a proof that you're the owner because that's what we agreed. That's what are the rules. This is why I pointed out here that this pyramid is exactly addressing that problem that it doesn't matter how secure your data are. If you're operating on a different governance, right? 
you uh, you can actually change the way how this information will be interpreted. Let's say the NFT in Europe will be taken seriously because it's your Rembrandt, but in China they will say that no, it's someone else, right? So I hope that that helps to understand the concept here. So it's not that the micro ledger addressed that problem because that's the problem laying in the governance layer, which obviously it's really depending on the situation where you are and the use case. Thank you. Thank you, Web. So I think I have, I'm going to have other questions later on, but uh, I'll, I'll loop back, but thank you. I'll switch back. Thanks. Yeah, happy to hear more. <laughs> Always happy to learn new stuff. So Dan, uh, do you have anything or uh, Rhonda? Anybody? Uh, well, okay. This is helpful. I would just, I, I put in the chat if, um, yeah, we'll take you up on the offer, Robert, of sharing this if you, um, uh, if you, you know, we'll, we'll put it in with the meeting notes, um, if you could share the, uh, the document. Yeah, I yeah. think, uh, Deepi and I can shoot to you the presentation and you will attach it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, uh, just, uh, um, we'll do so. it up yeah. on the meeting notes, which is normally. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Normally the case. So mm -hmm. fascinating, uh, presentation and I can, um, you know, I want to just make a couple of remarks here uh, just to sort of broaden my mind, hopefully. Uh, one of the things is this brings forth is the fact that it's an interoperability mechanism in a certain sense. Nothing prevents uh, there being a blockchain somewhere in the middle, but it extends it both in a sense before it enters the blockchain and after it goes out of the blockchain. So it, you could use this, this portability mechanism to come in and go out, come in and go out as many times as you want in different blockchains, in different uh, entities and so on. Uh, but in the end, it's the legality behind the registration mechanism and the recognition of that data as valid that counts and which is exists outside of all technical structures uh, in a sense. But uh, I have a feeling that we have this uh, political problem like the one that um, that uh, Dan and and uh, uh, and Drummond brought up about this GDPR and the hashing and why they think a one-way hash is they look at the very simplistic use case and then they say, oh, that reveals information. Uh, but, you know, so is many other ways of uh, techniques of doing things. Um, you have got to have a certain amount of sophistication and you've got to have a certain governance behind it. Otherwise, that mechanism can be broken. So that's uh, one thing. Now, we are looking into interoperability in DCGI, interoperability of uh, digital currencies. And one of the mechanisms that came up was something called message-based interoperability, which is nothing but something like this, because you're basically sending a message, and that message is self-contained. Uh, it's got either pointers to find where the metadata is, which you said were two types, the schema itself, the structure, and the rules, in addition to the actual data. So uh, there is, in Polkadot, for example, there is XCM, which is, because it's inside their ecosystem, they can control it. But nobody thinks about how can data come in and go out in a cryptographically secure and uh, uh, authentic way. Uh, I think that is that is a key for interoperability, and we are actually there is a lab in Hyperledger. We started defining uh, what we call cross-chain settlement instruction, which is it's almost like a swift message, but it's got cryptographic uh, 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 veracity. And, I mean, w ways to see, uh, you know, to check 
veracity embedded in it. Anyway, so this is all, you know, and also there's something called DCPI, I think, uh, in, in WEF, uh, which is uh, for uh, sending, uh, it was in the, uh, you know, in a trade finance context. It is also a message. They define a certain number of um, fields and these have to be there. It includes, of course, the cryptographic, uh, you know, signing fields and hashing fields and so on. But it's also been, been verified that it's legal under the Delaware law, which covers a lot of ground. And uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, take, you know, DCPI. I think uh, it has many similarities to this. And I, I hope we can bring back the DCPI folks. We had the DCPI folks, we had the Kerry folks, we had you guys doing the uh, decentralized semantics. Now we have all of this put together in a way in the microledger concept. And um, my uh, thought about blockchain was always the very words, block chain. It's a data structure. So, it, you know, ordering comes later. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you have to inject some other mechanism in order for ordering to remain an immutable and so on. But anyway, it's a fascinating hour and whatever. Actually, if um, I may add a comment to this one, which yes. uh, uh, I like to <laughs> kind of summarize this, that a lot of people think that the blockchain will replace your governance. That's not true. You need to have a governance, even if you will choose any blockchain, like you mentioned about the crypto moving, but uh, crypto moving between the different ledgers. Is that I could create my blockchain issue a million tokens, and now I will be able to transfer it to blockchain like a Bitcoin? No, I will not. I need to have a governance around all those stuff which actually set the rules. And if you split that this governance on top and the rest cryptographical assurance below, then it will be easier to address the problems, right? And then solves them in a proper way. So that's something which uh, which I think fascinating that a lot of people are actually still missing that. And, 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 and this is why we have those hypes with NFT, blockchains and all that stuff. Well, it's, it's all about the uh, genesis, right? I mean, the uh, not genesis, the Coinbase, transaction in Bitcoin, for example, is the money supply. Can there be other sources of money supply or supply, you know, coming from the outside? And if so, how do you enforce that? Or are you just saying that, okay, you're going to just take whatever comes and uh, point to that place. And it's, you're basically shuffling information, not actual on-chain value, which is what Bitcoin is all about. Uh, and, you know, so we have these two different concepts, right? I mean, you have the value sort of standing as a guard to the other stuff. You have to pay gas, you have to do this, you have to do, you know, all for rate limiting and preventing malicious behavior because, um, right. you know, so that's, that is the way the governance works there, but it's all self-contained. And in the end, you know, you got to have other, uh, other people who have a foot in both chains, like a, uh, you know, cross-chain exchange, uh, wrapped Ethereum or wrapped Bitcoin. Uh, so you have to have a party there. Anyway. Yeah. And, and maybe uh, one more thing regarding that, which uh, when you're thinking about decentralized ecosystems and obviously you're thinking about the blockchain as a one of the component, think about it that the blockchain is not truly decentralized on all the layers. What it means is that, for example, if you cut in the half the blockchain, it won't, uh, it won't work anymore. Right. But when you think about the data flows and the data uh, supply chains, right, or the data chains, uh, my data or whatever data I'm operating on are completely independent with your data, which you are using, right? So it should be possible to cut whatever we are using in the middle and split those data completely. And it should continue working as it is. 
And this is the biggest problem of those guys who are actually trying to apply blockchain within the data space, that they don't get that the data are completely independent in the sense that there is no global consensus about the flow of the data, right? There is no, there is no need for that. And the specific case of that example is identity. Identity doesn't need to have a blockchain and Kerry proves that, that uh, actually solves a lot of problems. And actually, if you use a blockchain, you introduce a lot of problems because of that. And, um, and, uh, and this is a slightly different way of thinking about the data as a secure uh, ecosystem or secure data flows uh, in an authentic way, that it needs to be truly decentralized technology to be able to achieve that. Otherwise, you're missing some of the properties of that and, and you basically uh, losing the characteristics of the decentralized ecosystem. Thank you. I think my, uh, my uh, speakers are, uh, are not coming through properly, my microphone. Uh, anyway, unless you have more to say, I think we we can. Uh, we no, can I'm happy to close the day. Uh, so obviously, if anyone would like to continue the discussion, get in get in touch. The email address is on the slides. I will send share the slides. So um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your time, and wish you have a nice day or evening. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. Thank you, guys. This is, that was very good. Thank you.